So here we are today. Um, any questions, like I mentioned, if you want to just pop them into the chat and I'll address them as they kind of come up and then you can still use the sticky board if anything is there. Um, let's see. So we were talking about our toxidromes and we went over all of those kind of clinical syndromes you'd expect to see based off of a particular exposure, right? So for instance, if you had someone who came in and they were, um, you know, tachycardic and they were kind of altered, having hallucinations and, um, you know, they had diminished or absent bowel sounds and they were very dry, had dry mouth, you know, um, you know, you should be able to expect what kind of toxidrome might that be and be able to assess to be like, okay, that sounds kind of like, you know, an anticholinergic, right? Because they kind of manifest a lot of those symptoms that are pretty consistent with that, right? So if I do ask questions like that on the exam, it'll be pretty straightforward. I'm not going to give you some kind of mixed picture where I give you like a beta blocker on top of, you know, Stefani Rhea on top of X, Y, and Z. It won't be quite as uh, difficult as that. Although that was what my boards were like. Those are pretty interesting, uh, which I may talk about at a later date. Um, anyway, so getting into patient assessment. Oh, Michael, I'm so sorry about the traffic. I know it was pretty tough getting from the bed to the, to the, the, the desk. I know I can have trouble at too. I'm usually tripping over dinosaurs and toys and all kinds of things. But um, anyway, getting to the patient assessments here, um, you know, again, this is kind of going, getting back into what we were mentioning with our um, toxidromes, right? So these are things you can expect to see uh, based on the type of drug exposure. And so again, these are all things I'm kind of looking at as a toxicologist to try to get an idea of like what kind of drug might a patient have been exposed to. So if someone's coming in bradycardic, well, if it's due to some sort of medicine or a drug exposure, you know, we, we know what kind of common things cause bradycardia. So things like beta blockers, obviously, things like clonidine or maybe non-DHP calcium channel blockers, right? I wouldn't expect someone had, had maybe been exposed to a beta blocker to come in tachycardic. That would be very inconsistent, right? But some things that can cause tachycardia. And again, the, the idea here is not to memorize these entire lists specifically, but like kind of the big ones you should be able to figure out based off of like, you know, a beta blocker, what it does, you know, it's going to slow down heart rate, right? You know, a sympathomimetic like cocaine or amphetamines, you know, they're, they're going to cause tachycardia, right? So these are kind of the things I want you to more focus on kind of the big hit topics, you know, anticholinergics like your first generation antihistamines, you know, those are going to cause tachycardia, right? In terms of hypotension, a lot of drugs can do this. Some things you would expect to see because they're cardiovascular drugs and some things you might not expect. Um, so for instance, like um, patients who have like significant iron exposure, they can get really hypotensive and acidotic and they can be really kind of scary uh, exposures to deal with. But even things like um, certain sedative hypnotics, right? So if you had someone who was um, exposed to like a barbiturate um, or maybe someone had maybe an anesthesia provider who had taken propofol or something, right? They could see hypotension tension related to that. So these are all things um, you'd expect to see there. In terms of hypertension, typically, you know, a lot of sympathomimetics are going to do this. So if a patient is exposed to um, cocaine or maybe they're doing um, meth or something like that, like you, know, you can definitely expect their blood pressure to be up. Um, but some things you might not expect, like for instance, if you had a patient who maybe was abusing thyroid supplements because they're using it for weight loss, for instance, right? They're taking Synthroid to help lose weight uh, and they become sort of this and this hyperthyroid kind of pictures, thyroid toxicosis, like certainly hypertension can be on that list there. Um, caffeine's a big one. I'm sure many of you might be exposed to this currently, but certainly if you see uh, patients who are taking very concentrated amounts, so for instance, um, things like, you know, no dose where they're like uh, very uh, compact tablets, very potent agents there, um, or they, you know, have 20 Red Bulls or something, who could say, right? Um, have you guys ever, I don't know if I've mentioned it before, um, you just mentioned it in the chat if I, if I haven't, but um, there's a website called Death by Caffeine. Um, that's a pretty interesting one. You can basically go in and put in your weight, um, put in your caffeine substance du jour and figure out how much of it you'd actually have to consume to get a lethal dose and you'd be surprised how much you'd actually have to get um you know, you know it's amounts of coffee that no reasonable person would ever ever be able to ingest uh, in a reasonable time frame so it's be pretty hard to do unless you got one of those kind of more potent sort of agents oh my goodness i'm not even 
slide mode. This is terrible. Um, in terms of temperature changes, you know, certainly we can expect to see certain things that cause hypothermia, and, and this is frequently for agents that are um, things that cause you to sort of have, uh, have a, a sedative sort of effect, or maybe things where patients are going to be um, sort of just like very still for long periods of time. So if you're like unconscious because of a sedative hypnotic exposure, especially if you have um, patients who maybe were abusing opioids and they were left outside or something and they didn't have any, I mean, obviously not in Florida, but you know, say for instance, they're up north or something like that, you can have, you know, thermal injuries related to that as well. Um, so that's something you can see not as common as hyperthermia though, because certainly we have lots of medications that can do that. So a lot of anticholinergics and some pathomimetics and even salicylates like aspirin very frequently can cause a lot of hyperthermia there. Um, so it's a very common thing to see with a lot of anticholinergic, um, some pathomimetic kind of products. Getting into um, you know changes in respiratory rate, this can be a big one as well. That can kind of help us out. So, for instance, um, you know, looking at brain apnea, things are going to have a more sedative effect. You can expect to see this. So, um, like your sedative hypnotics. So, if you had say like a barbiturate exposure, um, someone was abusing say large doses of benzos potentially or opioids for sure. Right? You should definitely know that one because opioids. That's one of the kind of classic triad of, of symptoms of opioid exposure is you know, respiratory depression, you can see that. But even things like clonidine can mimic the effects of opioids and frequently they look pretty similar when they come in there because you'll see these patients who are relatively sedate, kind of breathing's kind of shallow, you know, blood pressure, heart rate's a little depressed and it kind of looks like an opioid. And so um, interestingly enough, you can actually use uh, naloxone or Narcan on certain clonidine exposures and actually see some good um, effects on their, their mental status. But Anyway, getting the uh, tachypnea, this is where you can see this with things like um, salicylates is actually a really big one. Like this is something I use um, pretty frequently to assess patients who may have had uh, aspirin exposures. And in fact, um, we had one case where we actually had a, a patient who we suspected might have aspirin exposure and we weren't sure if we were having significant enough effects to um, actually initiate treatment or not. And then we usually go by levels in those cases there. And we actually had the, the lab called us up and they said, yeah, our, our, we can't run the assay right now. You, you know, we can't give you a level until a couple hours from now. And we needed to kind of know right then, like, is this a patient we really need to start treating or not? And based off their respiratory rate, they're so tachypnic, we ended up getting an ABG, which they still could run. And we saw they're having pretty significant respiratory alkalosis. And that gave us a sign that, yeah, there's probably enough salicylates here to warrant treatment. So we ended up go ahead initiating uh, the proper treatment for that patient there. But even things like cyanide, um, I don't know if anyone knows, but um, does anyone know where like a common source of cyanide exposure might be? Um, pop that in the chat if you have any guesses there. I'll mention that in a moment. But even like a lot of irritant gases. So for instance, if you have, uh, I actually remember one phone call I got at the Poison Center when I was doing my fellowship, and I never had actually thought about this before, but it makes perfect sense. Um, you know, I'm sure some of you have uh, been trying to clean before, maybe clean your bathroom or something, and you end up mixing something like bleach plus, uh, say, an ammonia-based compound, and you'll see that you actually develop, um, like a chloramine gas can develop there. It's a you know, strong irritant. You know, gets in your eyes, gets in your mucous membranes, a lot of coughing and, you know, um, you know, a lot of irritant effects. And so, of course, that's going to cause you to have to kidney because you're trying to, you know, get rid of all that gas effect. And, you know, we typically tell them to go into, you know, somewhere where they can get some fresh air. But, um, you know, I actually had one patient call up and he was, you know, coughing and gagging and he was just confused as to what was going on. But he said basically he was cleaning his girlfriend's litter box. He's trying to get some, some brownie points, I suppose, uh, and ended up spraying bleach product into the, the cat's litter box. And I don't know if you know this, but cat's urine has a lot of ammonia in it. So he ended up developing that chloramine gas and had a pretty significant effect there. So anyway, so again, these are just kind of common things that cause these typical types of uh, vital sign changes that you should be kind of keeping in the back of your mind when you're assessing this type of patients here. Um, in terms of meiosis, you know, certainly we can see things like your cholinergics, clonidine, opioids, set of hypnotics, you know, kind of typical things you expect to cause some meiosis. Again, don't use this as your final thing to make your, your final diagnosis here, because like there's certain opioids you may not see those pinpoint pupils, right? And you can't really use that to rule out an exposure. Um, in terms of mydriasis, you know, anticholinergics, um, antidepressants that have anticholinergic properties, you know, uh, sympathomimetics, these all typically cause uh, mydriasis. I tend to find that the anticholinergics tend to be stronger in terms of the mydriasis because they typically are not going to be as reactive to light as they would be with the sympathomimetics. So they have this big saucer looking pupils that are pretty, pretty pronounced when you see it. So uh, pretty interesting kind of look to a patient there. 
Um, in terms of diaphoresis, of course, anything causing hyperthermia can lead to this, so you'd expect to see your sympathomimetics and your salicylates. But also consider your cholinergic agents can do this too, right? If you recall um, your dumbbells, remember that they have diaphoresis is on there, right? So, um, or sweating is on, on there. So you can end up seeing that there's going to have a lot of, um, you know, just a, a lot of fluids going everywhere and the skin is going to be included in that, right? Um, in terms of dry mucous membranes, the opposite effect, right? Anticholinergics you expect to see there, you know? In terms of flush skin, you know, if they're looking very red, anticholinergics can do this, but interestingly enough, there are certain agents that can actually cause, um, they call it like a boiled lobster sort of appearance and it's actually boric acid so you know some of these things are kind of esoteric may not run into but it's good to have in the back of your mind so that way you can identify when it does come up um, anyway so you know you see here carbon monoxide and cyanide exposures can do this as well and that's actually um, where you see a lot of um, we see a lot of these exposures to both carbon monoxide and cyanide it's actually in house fires and so that is something you may see uh, especially if you work in a burn uh, places that have like a burn ward or um, uh, you know say like a trauma uh, center or something like that you may see those patients who have been exposed to house fires coming in and honestly like you know a lot of the um, cyanide comes from burning of like plastics and, and things like that um, you know uh, artificial fibers and things like that you know and will actually develop cyanide gas and so that's where you end up seeing those ex type of exposures now in terms of bullet that can form here this is more frequently associated with um, patients who maybe be down for a prolonged period of time so say they pass out and they're on the floor and they have those pressure ulcers that can or pressure you know um, that can develop and they can fill up with fluid uh, and that's where you see this bullet that can happen there so not common but something just to, to think about um, in terms of things that can cause seizures, this list is quite large, and, and again, I wouldn't expect you to memorize all of these, but um, certainly the ones we've talked about previously that are good to know. So for instance, and here's a, a, an example of another mnemonic we like to use, um, this is called Otis Campbell, which you can see it kind of listed out here. But the main thing to take away is there's just a ton of things that can cause uh, potential for, for seizures, right? So if you had someone, say for instance, um, a homeless patient, and they were being treated for TB, and they come in seizing, they have no previous history of it. Well, there's a lot of things that could be, right? So if they had a history of alcohol abuse, well, maybe they ran out of alcohol, right? They're having ethanol withdrawal. Uh, maybe they were taking isoniazid and they didn't have, you know, good stores of pyridoxine and all of a sudden now they're having seizures due to decreased production of GABA. And so the mechanisms can change, but overall, one of the big things to note is that um, whenever you have a toxin-induced seizure, like benzos are the way to go, right? We're not going to use Keppra. We're not going to use phenytoin for these. You just really got to get the GABA effect back. And so that's where, um, you know, lorazepam most frequently, but any of the benzos are going to be really helpful here. If that's not working, then as a backup, you can use things like propofol, for ex uh, example. Um, when I say methylxanthines, that really just includes like your caffeine and your um, uh, theophylline, but caffeine obviously being the much more common thing you'd end up running into, um, you know, clinically speaking. Um, so anyway, so there's a lot of things on this list here. You know, some of the common ones that we kind of know about already are good to know. Um, you know, again, just know the mechanisms are varied and what the treatments may be in those cases there. So, for instance, if you have an insulin overdose, and actually I just had a call about that just the other day, a patient had taken, um, you know, I think a whole pin's worth of Lantus, there's like 300 units, and injected that subcutaneously, um, you know, they're seizing because they're hypoglycemic, we'll give them sugar, right? So kind of look at what the obvious cause is and be able to fix that, and then you should be able to treat that seizure. Um, even certain odors can actually, uh, clue us into what type of exposure a patient may have had. And again, I just give this as an example here, just different things we can use to try to help us out with our diagnosis when we do have toxic exposures. Um, so for instance, things like, you know, mothballs, right? Mothballs have a very particular smell, maybe indicative of things like camphor, for instance, which is a common thing that can cause seizures uh, if you did have an exposure to that. Um, you know, methyl salicylate, it smells like wintergreen, right? So, you know, things like that. Um, and actually, there's an interesting one here, the rotten egg smell. If, if you ever smell rotten eggs, it's typically due to um, sulfides or sulfur-based uh, products, and that's actually going to come up in a little bit. we talk about an antidote in a few minutes. But um, there's a rash that's happening actually over in Japan where they were having patients who were committing suicide, and basically they were producing this hydrogen sulfide gas. It's a very rapid, uh, rapidly fatal agent there, but it smells like rotten eggs. And so that was one of the things when healthcare workers were going to try and save these patients there, they would start to get that smell, and that would clue them in that, hey, they, they probably need to stay away from this to keep them from being a potential patient as well. So you can look that up. It's kind of interesting. It's a sad thing, but it's, um, certainly interesting way these patients have decided to, you know, kind of off themselves. 
Um, this is a, a very good one to know. I would definitely um, recommend you know this for like your ER rotations or for the boards. Um, this is your white anion gap acidosis. You probably might have covered some of this with uh, maybe Dr. O recently, maybe on your nephro test, perhaps, I'm not sure, but um, knowing your mud piles is a really good mnemonic here. And I actually like to use the cat mud piles. So it adds on a few extra things that you might want to consider there. So certainly, um, you know, things like your toxic alcohols are on this list, like methanol, ethylene glycol. It's not something you see as commonly down here in warmer states, but certainly up north where it gets cold and you see a lot more radiator fluid and windshield washer fluid being used, they can see a lot more exposures there. Um, you know, things like DKA, things like iron. You want to be able to kind of pick up on these and rule them out um, when you have a patient who comes up with a wide anion gap acidosis, right? Um, I'm sure you guys can tell me in the chat perhaps how you actually calculate your anion gap and maybe what a normal or abnormal value is there. Um, and again, the mechanism for this stuff can can vary, but if you can try to easily rule some of these things out, it helps you to kind of you know kind of clue in on your diagnosis a little easier. So, for instance, if I have a patient who is, has a wide anion gap and I have a history they're on you know, treatment for TB, I can look to see, do they have any isonized possible exposures, right? Um, I can measure an iron level and rule that stuff out. Um, you know, you, there's a, there are things you can do, right? So if they're in DKA, obviously the sugars are going to be high. If it's normal, then it's probably not DKA, right? Um, and then just look at the sort of where they're coming from. What was the, the history there? So for instance, they're coming from a house fire. Well, that makes things like cyanide and carbon monoxide much more likely to happen. So again, just a good um, thing to know there. I'm not seeing anything in the chat, so I'll just tell you anyway, perhaps there's a delay, who knows. But uh, remember, it's your, your positives minus your negatives from your basic metabolic panel. So your sodium minus the product or the, the addition of your chloride and bicarb together. And typically anything above 16, I consider to be abnormal. And that kind of leads me down that road to thinking about the, the, you know, the mud piles here to make sure I can rule a lot of that stuff out. So um, we can even use some uh, imaging studies to help us out in terms of toxic exposure. So some things are radio opaque and they can actually clue us in um, to an exposure. So for instance, we use the mnemonic tripes here where um, certain things will show up on x-ray. So for instance, a lot of your metals will do this, like things like heavy metals, iron um, can do this for sure. Um, and again, sometimes it's helpful to make a diagnosis, but uh, this is one of those things where if you don't see it, you can't necessarily rule things out completely. Um, in some cases, we can even use um, CT scans to help us out. So if you have patients who are, um, say for instance, drug mules, we can look for those drug packets there in the GI tract. Sometimes they'll show up on the x-ray, but it's not as common. So, but CT scan will definitely show that sort of thing there. Um, but other things, including like your phenothiazines, so a lot of your antipsychotic drugs perhaps may show up on an x-ray, um, you know, enteric coated products potentially, and then any metals um, are going to be radio opaque. And if you recall, I mean, even same things you might not think about, like Pepto-Bismol, right? You can see those little punctate marks everywhere because of the bismuth that will actually show up on, on the KUB. So um, a lot of different things on there that may kind of, again, clue us in and help us uh, rule in on a diagnosis. So the next thing I want to get into is actually going to be about decontamination. And when I say decontamination, um, the best thing we can do for these patients is to eliminate the exposure, right? We don't want them to have any further exposure to the substance because that means that they could have more clinical effects, right? And so um, getting into the decontamination, there's a couple of varieties we'll talk about here. We'll talk about dermal, ocular, and then gastrointestinal. Uh, in fact, the, the GI ones are important because this is where, in terms of like just a pure drug exposure, you have someone who tried to overdose, um, this can be an important thing, but we'll look at some other ones as well. So in terms of dermal decontamination, um, it's always really important to make sure that um, the healthcare providers don't also become patients themselves. And so this is why it's really important to make sure that providers have appropriate PPE. And obviously this is a big topic nowadays because of uh, COVID-19 and all of that. Um, but again, you don't want the patients to be, uh, you know, the healthcare providers to become a new patient, right? Um, and so this is where decon can come into play here, especially dermal decon. Um, so once you make sure you have your people healthcare providers and appropriate PPE. Um, you wanna make sure that if a patient has any kind of like dermal exposure, um, to make sure you remove clothing first, all contaminated clothing. Um, I've had cases where patients have, um, you know, they're playing with an organophosphate or something, kids maybe, or maybe they're dealing with like cleaning solutions like, um, say something like Drano or something like that, that can be very quite caustic. Um, and they'll have a skin exposure, but they don't actually get rid of the clothes that have got the product on it too. And that continues to lead to further exposure. So that's a really important pot, uh, spot there. And then in terms of um, 
how we get rid of the product there, they say, you know, dilution is the solution to pollution. So we like to flush pretty vigorously with water at a very minimum, but frequently, especially if you don't know if your product is particular, particularly like lipophilic, maybe, um, water plus soap can be a really big help there. So if you got soap available, use that. Um, occasionally use like dilute bleach solutions as well. It can all be very useful there. And then another thing to consider, especially with patients who may be larger, if they have a lot of skin folds, make sure you go ahead and get in there as well. There's been cases where even things that might not have been all that particularly dangerous in terms of a dermal exposure, they will have like gases and things like that will get caught in these skin folds um, and they'll just sit there and just, just eat away at that tissue. So that's a really important thing as well to make sure they get all of that um, areas um, sort of uh, addressed after you get your patient undressed, right? Because it's normal decontamination. But um, looking at ocular decontamination, this is an important one as well, because a lot of different substances might be quite caustic to the ocular tissue here. And so um, we talk about time being tissue. And so this is important to get this initiated uh, quickly. And so um, for one thing, if you have a patient with contact lenses in, get those out immediately, because that can be um, kind of a reservoir for further drug exposure. So get rid of that. Um, and then sometimes what we have is uh, available to us is called a Morgan's lens. And this is kind of a neat product where basically, um, first off, you want to make sure you anesthetize the patient's eye. So you can use something like tetracaine potentially. And basically, you're going to be hooking up uh, to an IV set that normally has, a, uh, say, like a liter of saline um, hooked up to it. And you have this little contact lens looking thing with a tube on it. And basically, you place that into the patient's eye. And then this will then irrigate through with normal saline. The idea is you just kind of constantly flush that stuff out uh, to make sure you get rid of it. And um, frequently here, the biggest things we worry about are going to either be acids or bases that get into the eye. So for instance, um, I recall one case where we had, I think, probably like a six or seven year old boy. Um, you know, this is up in, in Duval County, right? So, you know, there are parts of Duval County that's pretty, pretty country. And, um, you know, these two kids were playing at home and they didn't really have any toys available to them. And so they decided to throw around an empty bottle of Drano tossing it back and forth and all of a sudden the cap came off and the kids got splashed in the eye i mean you know i don't know if anyone's ever like rubbed their eye with you know has saw some jalapeno or capsaicin on their fingers but like it, it hurts and so this stuff was pretty pretty nasty in terms of um, caustic injuries so the patients come in screaming bloody murder can't get this morgan lens in because he's fighting us so hard um you know, but we got to do it, right? Because time is tissue. And so we ended up um, eventually giving the kids some ketamine just to like, just knock them out. He was chilled out finally. We can get the Morgan lens, is, Morgan lens in and then flush that eye out. And it's really important whenever you have these caustic exposures, make sure you get um, back to a normal somewhat pH for the eye, which is typically around 7.2 or so it would be fine. Um, in those cases there, that's a big thing, but really 15 to 30 minutes of, of flushing is important. If you did have something like a Morgan lens, sometimes what we'll do, especially with like EMS outside of the hospitals, you can actually take a nasal cannula, hook that up to a liter of saline and just put that over the bridge of the nose. And that way it'll just kind of run into the eyes. And again, you want to run away from the, the eyes themselves. So kind of make sure it's going in the right direction in those cases. So getting into the GI decontamination, next we have uh, a couple different agents here, most of which I'm gonna tell you not to ever use, uh, some of which are not actually available any further, but um, still important to know about so you can at least talk about them. Uh, Cause patients still think we do a lot of this stuff even though we really don't. Um, the first one being syrup of Ipecac. And so this is actually something you can really only find as like a very dilute, like homeopathic substance, but it used to be kind of um, just the most common thing we'd use for GI decontamination. Uh, so Kylie says, how do you prevent the Morgan's lens flush the uh, flush acid base into the nose or the mouth? Um, typically with the patients being laid, um, it kind of flows in the direction outside of the eye. So you'll typically find that's not usually a concern. Just with the way that the face is kind of oriented, patients are laying back, it'll flow in the right direction. Um, and again, you're using a ton of saline to flush through the eyes here. So it's gonna be something where, um, you know, it'll be diluted out. So we typically don't see a lot of other injury to the skin potentially. That's a, that's a good question. But yeah, patients should be lying back um, and, and, you know, for, for that procedure. So um, anyway, so getting a syrup at Vipicac, basically this is um, a product that directly stimulates the chemoreceptor trigger zone. And so it causes very severe emesis, um, uh, as you can see in this picture here. This is, I don't know if anyone's ever seen this clip from Family Guy, but it's quite funny. 
the the issue with it was is that in a lot of cases um, you'd actually find that it's not all that effective and especially with GID contamination kind of the golden rule is um, you need to get things done within an hour after the ingestion if you can't get there within the hour for the most part most of it goes past the pylorus of the stomach and you're not really going to get a whole lot of benefit there and so in this case here um, with Ipecac one we would see that the problem was is that we wouldn't really get a whole lot of return on investment so to speak in terms of getting the drug out or whatever the substance was and not only that but also then you have to worry about patients aspirating right and so if you get all that gi content down into the lungs that can be worse than the substance they might have gotten already right and so the other big concern was too was the fact that um, this was a common agent used by patients with bulimia who are trying to induce emesis in order to lose weight and what they actually found is that it can cause cardiomyopathy so you'd have these relatively young thin patients who are coming in uh, complaining of like maybe you know um you know, you know dyspnea on exertion and just fatigue and all these things and you do an x-ray and you saw this huge heart and you're like well how did this happen and then you go down and get the history and it's like okay wow they've you know, been abusing this stuff for for a while and so because of that they basically removed it from the market and so if you do see it, it's probably like a homeopathic product um, but you know uh, it's not really going to do the same thing as like a true you know syrup of ipecac product there i think in my my tox um, memorabilia i have a bottle of thing that expired back in 85 but I, I have not tried it and nor will i try it um, the next thing here is gastric lavage. This is something you frequently will not do um, unless it is a life-threatening ingestion. And the other big thing too is that you have to be within an hour uh, of exposure. And so frequently you either get patients that are presenting too late or maybe you don't know the time of exposure. So if a patient maybe was exposed to an opioid and they're unconscious and they can't tell me when it happened, then I can't necessarily assume it was within the hour. And so we frequently, um, due to the complications of these procedures, we will just go ahead and skip it in a lot of cases. Um, let's see, Sarah had another Morgan Lynn's question. Can you only use it if you're sure there aren't any particles in the eye? Do you have to pick a quick flush first before applying? Um, most of those patients will probably have had some degree of flushing beforehand as you're getting the Morgan Lynn's set up. Um, so not necessarily. I mean, th this thing is flushing a lot of fluid through, so I've not seen any issues with like, you know, corneal abrasions or anything with particles that get stuck in there just because you are flushing just a ton of water straight through that, that thing there. So I'm, I'm not aware of any issues uh, that, uh, that have come up from using that. So um, anyway, with the with the gastric lavage, typically what we're doing is we will go ahead and place an NG tube into the patient. Um, and then you can see this device here, basically you're gonna be flushing in either tap water or in some cases things like normal saline into the patient. And then basically, and I wish I had a picture of the, the tube itself, but um, there's tiny holes um, that are gonna be placed throughout the NG tube. That the idea is you flush all this fluid into the stomach and then you suck it back out. And the idea is you're gonna get all that drug back out and then you can eliminate it, right? So that way you kind of eliminate the exposure. Problem is, is that you're gonna find these patients, um, one, are gonna be presenting too late, so you can't really use it. The other thing too is that the holes are not really gonna be um, good for a lot of products to be to fit through, right? The holes are gonna be such that maybe like a small tablet, like maybe a digoxin or something can get through. Um, but like if you have like a big iron tablet or if you have like a big um, you know lithium tablet or something like that, there's no way it's gonna get through there. So again, you have limited efficacy for this. Um, but maybe if I had a patient who like had just ingested like a ton of like you know a toxic alcohol or something, and I knew it was there in the stomach, maybe do it. But for the most part, I really don't recommend this to patients, uh, or recommend this to providers to do for patients. Um, typically, we'll put them on their left lateral decubitus position because this helps to um, prevent elimination of contents to the stomach to some degree. It helps, but. Um, that's what we're gonna do there. And again, um, if patients are at risk for aspiration, normally we're just not gonna do this. So um, unless they have their airway secure, or they can secure their airway. Um, this is something we don't necessarily uh, initiate very frequently. But again, you know, you always like talk to patients and they're like, oh no, like, you know, they call the poison center and they're like, oh, they have to go pump my stomach. Like, that's what they're talking about. And and oftentimes we don't because again, aspiration risk is an issue. Um, but here's some other things um, that are gonna be contraindications to using it. So for instance, if it's a foreign body that could be an aspiration risk, don't do it, right? Because again, I'm more worried about the airway uh, obstruction than I am about, you know, probably the product and the, the GI tract. Um, any kind of corrosive substances, um, acids and bases, if they burn on the way down, they're going to potentially burn on the way back up if the patient vomits. Um, and so typically this is going to be contraindication for, for lavage. And this will come up again when we look at some of the other um, 
GID contaminants, um, hydrocarbons as well. The, if you had something like, um, say, you know, kerosene or some kind of like gasoline or something like that, um, they frequently as well can be an issue if you were to aspirate them and cause pretty significant pneumonitis. So we don't do that. Um, and as I mentioned, if the toxin's bigger than the lavage tube hole, there's no way you're going to be able to get that absorbed through, pull through. So um, it's just not going to be all that effective there. And again, uh, some other complications, including the aspiration, is especially if they've had, um, say, like a caustic injury, pretty strong caustic injury, you could see esophageal perforation. So again, another reason why this would be contraindicated for those corrosive ingestions. So the one thing we do recommend with some regularity is actually going to be activated charcoal. And so again, this is going to be within one hour of ingestion. And actually, if you have something that's slowing down the GI tract, like an opioid or an anticholinergic, we'll give them up to two hours potentially. So if I have that history, you know, if I've had someone who had ingested a bunch of, um, say, um, a Tylenol PM, right? So it has Benadryl or uh, diphenhydramine plus acetaminophen, that's, a, that's something I could do within two hours, right? For most other things, though, it's going to be one hour. And the idea is with this activated charcoal, basically it's treated to extremely high um, high heat and pressure that causes the surface area to be huge. I think like a bottle of this stuff has like the surface area of a football field. And the idea is, is it's going to bind up to all the medications or substances that might be in the GI tract um, and prevent it from being absorbed and then it'll be just eliminated in the feces here. And so it absorbs a lot of toxins, and so it's pretty, pretty, uh, you know, has a wide application for a lot of different substances there. Um, and you can see typical dosing we do between 25 and 50 grams, um, or about one gram per kilo in peds. And again, I'm not gonna ask you dosing on the test, but just to, for, for reference's sake. So um, the important thing to know about activated charcoal is what it does not bind to. So for instance here, you're gonna see that metals is gonna be something that charcoal just doesn't work on, right? So if I have someone who came in for an iron ingestion, say they took a whole bunch of prenatal vitamins, this is not gonna be all that effective, right? Uh, lithium, hydrocarbons, alcohol is another important thing. Frequently alcohols, because they're liquid, are gonna get passed through the pylorus of the stomach so quickly. Anyway, it's difficult for charcoal to catch up, but also just doesn't bind to it as well. Um, However, if I had a mixed ingestion, let's say someone had bipolar disorder and depression, and they took a whole bunch of their TCAs and lithium, well, while that charcoal might not bind to the lithium, I can give it for the TCA potentially, so you still may see it used for mixed ingestions there. Um, in terms of contraindications, a big thing to watch out for is going to be for aspiration risk, right? So if there's a foreign body, um, uh, if it is a corrosive substance, anything like that, you don't want to use this because, again, they aspirate to the respiratory tract. It's not going to be great things there, okay? Um, and then any intestinal obstruction, um, obviously charcoal is not going to be able to pass through, and so that could cause uh, further obstruction. So that's a relative contraindication there. Um, so... Uh, Last thing here is gonna be whole bowel irrigation that we can do. And so this is basically where um, instead of trying to bind up the drug um, or trying to prevent the absorption here, um, in this case, we just wanna flush everything through as quickly as possible to try to prevent it from being absorbed. And so we'll do this with polyethylene glycol or go lightly solutions. And you know, like the same thing we do is for like a bowel prep or something. And we wanna flush the entire GI tract out. And so you can see here the rates we're giving between like, you know, 500 mLs an hour to start with up to two liters an hour. And so while some patients may be able to drink this, it is very unlikely they're going to be able to. Um, if you recall, I mentioned that, you know, go lightly kind of tastes like warm sweat because it's room temperature and it has a bunch of electrolytes in it. So it's kind of salty tasting. Um, it's not great. And so to expect someone to drink anything at two liters an hour rate uh, would be quite difficult, right? Um, so frequently we're putting an NG tube down the patient and we're going and running this on a pump. And again, two liters an hour is a lot. So again, you're gonna expect a lot of bloating. You can expect to see potential for um, vomiting. So again, you wanna make sure you treat for that as well. And our goal is to make sure we have clear rectal effluent, right? So that sounds pretty descriptive there. Um, but the idea is we wanna flush everything through, make sure when it's coming out clear, then we know, yeah, we've gotten everything that we can. And so um, the other big thing to make sure is you gotta make sure we can get that NG2 place. You gotta confirm placement of the tube. So make sure you can hear you know, bubbles in the, in the stomach and things like that if you're pushing air through. Um, because if you run go lightly into the lungs, that's not great. You're going to cause pretty pretty significant um, uh, pneumonitis and, and bad effects. Um, so what is this good for? This is typically good for stuff that maybe charcoal is not great for. So right, heavy metals uh, for sustained release products and maybe able to absorb throughout the entire GI tract. Or potentially we can use it for body packers and stuffers. And so I've kind of alluded to the body packers before. 
body packers are typically people that are like drug mules or they're going on a trip somewhere and they have large amounts of product that are pretty well wrapped in a lot of cases um body stuffers are typically people that are going to be um say for instance like you're a drug dealer you're on the street and all of a sudden you see some red and blue lights you're worried about getting arrested and being caught with all this drug product on you and so maybe you just go ahead and swallow it right so it's typically smaller amounts but um maybe they're not quite as well wrapped and maybe you know it's in some you know plastic wrap or something like that that can open up and then can be absorbed so stuff like cocaine in the gi tract is not great because it causes a lot of vasoconstriction and can lead to mesenteric ischemia and death right so um, in those cases we have body packers and stuffers we can use go lightly to go ahead and flush all that stuff through and so, um, as I mentioned, uh, these are what it's used for. Sometimes we'll actually do charcoal followed by the go lightly. So that's good for like mixed ingestions. Um, we call it go darkly at that point. And you can also use the charcoal. It's kind of like a tracer. So you kind of know how far we've kind of working everything through the GI tract when the patient um, is, is on that bedside commode. So um, something I don't recommend frequently because it's pretty difficult to do. And it kind of requires one-on-one -on -one nursing to patient ratio. And that, that's hard in any situation, whether it be in the ICU or, or in the ED for sure. So um, one product I wanted to talk about here in uh, more detail is actually going to be acetaminophen. Um, and so I talk about this mainly because um, it's such a ubiquitous product. You're going to find it everywhere. I can go to Costco or Walmart or anywhere and buy just huge amounts of it. Most people have it in their homes. And as such, it is a frequent ingestion. Um, you see, for intentional harm, maybe for accidental harm, say if someone has a lot of pain issues and they don't realize how much they're taking, or maybe they're taking this in conjunction with other products like you know, Percocet or, or Lortab or something like that. And so th the other big problem with the acetaminophen we're going to find is it doesn't really have a clear defined toxidrome. You can have patients who have had massive ingestions of acetaminophen who are asymptomatic for hours, maybe even a day. Um, and so this makes it a pretty difficult clinical sort of um, issue. So just to make sure you guys aren't completely bored, I wanted to really spice up the lecture here by going over the biochemical transformation of acetaminophen in, in the body. Um, and so basically here we're starting out with, with acetaminophen, right? So um, how does it get eliminated through the body? And so most of the time you're going to see they can go through some of these conjugation pathways. So if some of it gets eliminated unchanged, some of it gets this glucuronic conjugation, some of it goes to the sulfation pathway, and this is the majority of it. And these are, these are safe byproducts that your body can just eliminate no problem. Well, what happens when you have a, um, say, a massive ingestion? Let's say you overwhelm these pathways. What happens here? Well, basically, by overwhelming that, you're going to get a larger percentage of this going through this uh, other pathway here, the CYP enzyme pathway. It's actually CYP2E1. And it's going to cause this formation of this product called NAPKE. And normally, NAPKE is not going to be a big problem, um, mainly because we have the ability to glutathione conjugate that into a non-toxic product here, right? So um, this is not a big deal under normal circumstances. When you have really big ingestions here, you're going to find that you're going to overwhelm this. You're going to form a lot of NAPKE, and this is what leads to that hepatic injury, right? So we've talked about, you know, Tylenol is bad on the liver. This is why. It's because you have this NAPKE form, uh, formation here. But it's not just bad on the liver. It's going to be bad on the kidneys. It's bad on the heart. It's bad on a lot of things. And so these patients have really massive ingestions of the Tylenol, they can get really, really sick. The question is, when is that going to happen? And so, um, again, looking at levels here, you can see that, you know, a typical therapeutic dose is between like 10 to 15 mg per kilo for a patient here. And these patients, uh, they get above levels of, say, 150 to 200. This is where they can get into trouble. So it's, you know, not that much more than what a typical therapeutic dose is. It's quite easy for patients to get a toxic amount potentially, you know, five, six grams can be enough to be an issue for some patients, right? So anyway, as I mentioned, the NAPKE forms those covalent bonds. It causes a lot of cellular death. It also forms a lot of free radicals. So you get a lot of oxidative damage that happens here. And as I mentioned, it's not just the liver that takes a hit, but it's a lot of other organ systems as well that we worry about. So, um, and some patients tend to be more likely to become toxic than others. So for instance, if they have, say, uh, they're taking many frequent doses over the course of a long period of time, they can have that kind of chronic sort of ingestion where they're kind of, um, uh, it's more of an insidious sort of um, uh, sort of presentation there. Um, if they are chronic alcoholics, this can be an issue because you'll find that alcohol actually upregulates CYP2E1, so they're just producing more of that enzyme, meaning they're more likely to form more of that NAPKE. Um, and then if they have reduced glutathione, um, con uh, glutathione um, stores, they also tend to be at risk because they will not be able to go through those safe sort of metabolic pathways. 
So, um, and I kind of want to work, work you through a few stages here because this is really important to understand. And I find a lot of providers don't really know this as uh, intrinsically as I do. And that's okay because that's why they call it the poison center, right? Um, but the thing you have to understand is that Tylenol doesn't really present with a lot of signs and symptoms until like 24, 36 hours out. So kind of walk you through the few steps here. First, stage one, typically the first 24 hours, no hepatic injury is seen. You can check LFTs, typically don't find anything going on, right? Patients most likely are asymptomatic, but they really have, do have large ingestions. Sometimes you have maybe some nausea, vomiting, some malaise, but really kind of non-specific symptoms here. Um, very rarely will they come in with, you know, loss of consciousness and, and a metabolic acidosis. I've very rarely ever seen this. But where it gets um, more tricky is when you get into like this 24, 36 hour kind of time frame. This is where you're gonna to start to see your transaminases are elevating. So you're gonna see AST, ALT start to rise. And the other really big thing I worry about as well, because you know they call them liver function tests, but really looking at AST, ALT doesn't really tell me how well the liver is functioning. What I look at is usually gonna be things like bilirubin and PTINR. It's telling me how well is the liver actually doing its job there. And if I start to see PTINR going up, now, I know the liver's not producing those clotting factors like it should. And you can also look at things like lactate as well to help you out. And so these will be sort of a, a later thing that normally show up with massive, with like really large injections, but they could show up as early as that 24 to 36 hour mark. And then the stage three, this is where patients that they're going to die most frequently do. Um, you know, then you know the three to five days sort of mark here. But this is where um, they're going to have further increases in transaminases. They can get up into the several you know, tens of thousands potentially. You know, have jaundice. This is where they can get some of the other um, sort of uh, bad effects from the Tylenol, like the renal failure, cardiac toxicity. Um, you know, altered mental status from the encephalopathy of the the uh, due to the liver dysfunction you're seeing there. Um, pretty nasty stuff. And this time, you know, it can be kind of hit or miss whether or not these patients are going to be able to actually recover from this. So it could be pretty dangerous. I'll give you a good clinical scenario here in just a few minutes. And yeah, hopefully they'll make it to stage four where they can recover. And then um, you may find that it takes weeks to months for that to have complete resolution. But the, the liver is a pretty amazing uh, organ that's able to repair itself. And, and so you will find they will have complete resolution at some point. And, but some cases they actually do require, you know, liver transplant, even though it's not... Um, you know, not uh, common, but you can see it potentially. So, um, you know, with these patients here, this is why, again, whenever you have um, a potential drug exposure, you always check a Tylenol level. You always do it just because these patients will be asymptomatic in, in many, many cases. Uh, so there's asking, are there any commonly taken medications or substances that cause 2E1 induction? Um, Mostly alcohol is probably the most common one there. There are a few others. So um, I believe you have patients on isoniazid that can do it as well. Um, that can predispose them. But it's alcohol is probably the most common one you end up seeing there. So um, anyways, as I mentioned, the, the, the history is often unreliable. So we, that's why you always check a Tylenol level. So if you ever see like a tox workup, always get an APAP level. Um, in terms of the amount ingested, you can see here even doses above 7.5 grams. I guess a single ingestion for an adult can be enough to be toxic. And then for kids, between 150 and 200 mg per kilo is usually when we'll consider sending them in to get further evaluation. And what we do here is we use what we call the Rumac Matthew nomogram. And so this is um, a pretty commonly used nomogram. You'll probably see it maybe somewhere on their boards or uh, if you do like your ER rotation, something like that, you'll run into this. And this is the nomogram we use to determine how likely patients are going to develop hepatic toxicity from their Tylenol exposure. And so um, I don't know if you guys ever will get the chance to like meet like you know one of your, your clinical heroes but i actually got to meet dr rumack uh, at a conference one time dr matthew had actually been dead for several years at that point but it was like meeting a rock star for the first time so probably says more about me than anything else but anyway so the point here being is that this is an omogram where you can chart the patient's tylenol level and based on where they show up on this line you can determine whether or not you need to start treatment and we'll talk about the antidote here in just a few minutes and the typical thing you think about is that at level of 150 micrograms per ml at four hours, anything above that you would consider to be treatment. You wanna go ahead and start the antidote. Um, if it's say four hours post ingestion and say it's 100, then you don't have to do anything. The level's elevated for sure, but they're not gonna be at risk or very significant risk for hepatic injury, you're good to go. You don't have to do anything. But let's say they come in and it's eight hours past the ingestion, right? So look at this. Well, you see, okay, if it's above 75, then yeah, they're probably gonna to need to go ahead and treat anyway. So again, plotting out where the ingestion happened, where their level is at, and seeing if they're above this line. If they're above it, you treat, okay? It's pretty straightforward. The, the issues come in though is when you don't know when the patient might have ingested it, 
that can be troubling. Um, if you have no idea whatsoever, typically patient or providers are more conservative and they just go ahead and treat anyway. So we tend to over treat rather than under um, because it could be really significant and kind of late presenting when these patients do become symptomatic. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. Let me know if that doesn't like make good sense. We can go over it again. And again, when we're monitoring these patients, you know, Tylenol levels, LFTs, we're monitoring for um, PT, INR is another thing there. And actually, you know, what's interesting is that I have uh, some providers who will just go off of the Tylenol level. And so sometimes what we'll have is we'll actually have patients who will show up presenting very late. Like, say, for instance, they were to um, ingest a huge amount of Tylenol on Monday, Monday morning, and then Tuesday morning, they're like, oh man, I really shouldn't have done that. I'm starting to feel kind of weird. Um, and they go into the ER and tell them what they did. That Tylenol level might be negative at that point, but their LFTs are starting to rise. Okay, remember, it's not the Tylenol itself that's doing the damage, it's that NAPKE metabolite. So I'll have some providers will say, well, you know, the Tylenol level is negative, I don't have to do anything. It's like, no, their LFTs are in the hundreds, several hundreds, maybe a thousand. You gotta still treat. And so we'll talk about some of the other finer points of that in a few minutes. Um, you know, for more, Significant ingestions, you know, I'll check a PT, INR, especially if the LFT is already starting to rise. And the BMP is helpful to tell me kind of what, uh, if there's any kind of acid base disorders kind of going on. Make sure electrolytes and all that are good. Keep in mind too, the glucose could become an issue uh, as well, because where do we produce a lot of our glucose for blood sugar? From, from the liver, right? So you can see where that can be an issue. So anyway, in terms of management, you know, obviously start with the ABCs for these patients here. In terms of GID contamination, if it's within the hour, go ahead and give the activated charcoal. That can maybe potentially prevent a toxic amount of Tylenol and absorb a lot of it so that way the level never really gets to a point where you have to actually end up treating it. Um, if it's you know something where it's like Tylenol plus uh, diphenhydramine or say Tylenol plus an opioid you know then maybe have up to two hours I would go ahead and recommend it at that point as well. Um, the hypoglycemic you know, you give them sugar, right? I probably wouldn't give them glucagon, mainly because you're trying to stimulate the liver to produce glucose. And if they're hypoglycemic due to this, their liver is probably not in the state where it's going to be able to really help out very much. In terms of coagulopathy, you know, we can give vitamin K, but obviously the liver is not really doing its job. So there's limited capability for this to really help. In rare cases, do we need blood products? But that's something, you know, you consider on a case by case basis. And then there's um, what we call the King's criteria in terms of determining if a patient is going to be a candidate for a transplant. And I, I wouldn't memorize these here, but just know that there are certain things we're looking for to determine, um, you know, is this a good candidate who is severely sick enough where their liver is unlikely to recover on its own and we want to go ahead and give them a new one potentially. So this is very uncommon we do this, but uh, you know, there's been some cases I've, I've encountered where patients have had accidental ingestions, maybe over a long period of time. If it's an intentional ingestion, that's a harder sell, but it just depends on a case by case basis. So. Um, so again, so what can we do to treat this, right? How do we deal with this? Well, basically what we can do is we can replace what the liver is missing to help metabolize off all these products here. So um, as I mentioned, you know, these systems get overwhelmed when you have a massive ingestion and the system here gets overwhelmed with glutathione conjugation. Well, what if I could replace some of those cofactors? And so this is where NAC comes into play. NAC stands for N-acetylcysteine. And you can see a few places here where one, it's helping it to provide the, the um, necessary uh, molecules to do a sulfation, right? So you can see it there. And then it also helps out with this glutathione conjugation as well. So kind of two main ways that this helps. NAC is also a nice um, uh, free radical scavenger. It's an antioxidant. And so this can actually help to deal with a lot of those kind of extra hepatic sort of effects you can see as well. So as I mentioned, it's a glutathione precursor, it can donate itself hydro groups, uh, and it helps to substitute for that glutathione. So it helps in a lot of those different metabolic pathways there. The nice thing about N-acetylcysteine is that if it's given within eight hours of the ingestion, it's like 100% effective in preventing the need for liver transplant and death, right? So it's very, very effective. The problem is when patients show up after eight hours of ingestion, but um, in a lot of cases, we'll still give it even after that time frame because of that free radical scavenging. We actually do see some uh, mortality benefits uh, when we give it later. So, um, and the interesting thing about NAC as well is that it actually, um, because of all the sulfhydro groups, all that sulfur, it actually smells like rotten eggs. So that'll be important when we talk about administration in just a few minutes here. Um, the one thing I forgot to mention with the um, the Rumac Matthew nomogram too, is that keep in mind it starts at four hours. So you can get a level beforehand, um, but it, you can't plot it on the nomogram. This is the way, only way it's been validated. So this is an important feature here. If you get an hour that, or a level at two hours, you gotta repeat it at four hours. So make sure you, do, you mark that down because um, I see a lot of providers who will try to plot it. A level is done at like one hour, two hours post ingestion. And it just doesn't, doesn't work that way. Okay. 
So anyways, we talked about NAC, um, getting into how we give it. There's two different varieties of the oral um, and acetylcysteine, which is known as mucomist, and then there's an IV form called acetidote. Um, the main difference is between cost and, and in terms of efficacy, they're equal, right? So that's the nice thing there, and they're both very, very safe products. There's two ways we can give it. Um, there's the IV um, way we can do it, which is a 21-hour protocol. And again, don't memorize the dosing here. I'm just kind of giving you this to illustrate it. And then there's the PO protocol. And so you can see here that this is a 72 hour protocol you're doing there. So you're treating for a lot longer, um, but this is the way we did it for a long time just because that's all we had, right? And so some providers like this better, the IV one, because it's only 21 hours and you kind of died at that point. So that's one thing in its favor there, but it is more expensive and um, there's some other issues with it as well, which I'm not going to delve too much into. But um, the, the product with giving it as a PO is because of all that sulfur that's in it and it smells like rotten eggs patients are less likely to take this especially if they're trying to harm themselves and they're not really all that willing to go along with treatment anyway and you know stuff smells like rotten eggs and they're going to want to vomit and so they got to give them some zofran for that and then you know um they may not really take the whole dose and there's a lot of issues with it so for the most part i try to shy patients uh, or providers to giving the try to get them to use the iv therapy because it's just just easier that way um i will tell you my first uh, day working in a hospital pharmacy as an intern, um, they we also, if you recall back to our talks of CF, we used um, Nucamist as a mucolytic, if you recall, um, as an inhaled uh, product that you can nebulize it and you can use it for that. Um, well, my first job as an intern when I was uh, in pharmacy school at the hospital is they said, okay, here's a big vial of N-acetylcysteine and you got to take up and put it into little little bottles so that way we can use it for our neb. So there's like a big like 30 ml vial and I was putting it into little 3 ml aliquots here for the respiratory tax to use right um and so i got to sit there and smell rotten eggs for like my first week working there and that was um basically the point where i got desensitized to it and now it just smells like regular eggs to me so i don't know is what it is but stuff smells rotten if you ever get a chance to smell it i would try it out because it's you know, interesting um all right, so that's kind of, oh, and the other uh, point there is if, you know, our protocols are inadequate, if we have patients who are still having um, issues and their LFTs are still high and tunnels are still positive at the end of these protocols, we just continue giving more. So I'll give you an idea of a, a good case that I had one time. Uh, I had a patient who, um, he was, I think it was like a graphic designer, but he lost his job, had like two kids, a wife, and he was like really worried about not being able to provide for them. So he said, you know, he's depressed. So I'm just going to end it all, right? So he goes and takes a huge amount of acetaminophen, just a massive amount. Um, he says, all right, I'm going to go to sleep and that'll be, it. I'll, you know, die in my sleep and everything will be over. Um, guy wakes up the next morning. He's like, wow, I, I survived. Like everything must be good, right? Well, not really, because now you know that it takes time for tonal toxicity to occur. And so it wasn't until later that day they actually went over to the library. He's looking it up. He's like, well, what happened here? Why didn't I, why didn't I die? And he was looking at it and he's like, oh, oh, this doesn't have any, this doesn't show up until 24 hours later. So he didn't actually come up to the ER until he was already, I've never seen one John, just as John as this uh, gentleman was in my entire life, just yellow from head to toe, looked like he was just covered in mustard practically. And so he was already having significant bumps in his LFTs. Um, his LFTs were in the you know tens of thousands. His INR was already starting to bump and he was very, very sick. The problem is he was presenting way after that uh, eight hour mark and so at that point too, we didn't even care what his tunnel level was. We knew he needed an acetylcysteine. So we started the protocol and I think he ended up being like on four days worth of the IV therapy, four or five days worth before we started to see resolution of his LFTs started to come back down. Uh, PTI and R started to normalize out and he ultimately ended up surviving. And that was very kind of hit or miss there for a while. He's in the ICU for, for quite a period of time there. Um, so he ended up doing okay, just showing you how well the liver can recover itself. But uh, it's one of those things where, again, you gotta check it for every intentional ingestion because if you miss it, and those patients come back 24 hours later, um, that, that can be a problem. It can be kind of playing catch up with your with your antidote there. So that's it for acetaminophen. I don't know if you have any questions. I look on the, the board here. I have a few sticky notes. Let's see. Um, weird question, but I remember reading something that in ancient times, wealthy people would drink a tea to make themselves vomit after a fancy meal so they continue eating. Any links to Ipecac? GID contamination. Um, this is probably something similar to that. The um, syrup of Ipecac actually comes from a plant-based product. It's called the uh, Ipecacuana plant, I believe. And so that would make sense if they were using something similar to that. So you could definitely like brew that into a tea. Uh, I don't know if it's that specific product, but yes. So um, I would not recommend doing that. Um, I think you might may have an eating disorder if you're doing that. So I would recommend against it. 
Um, let's see. How to decontaminate compounds that can react with water like sodium. That's interesting. Because um, it probably would have reacted with the patient's skin already. Um, I guess ideally you just use a ton of ton of water. I mean, like just, I mean, we're using just gallons of stuff to flush these patients here. Uh, especially if you're like in a, a mass casualty event or something where you're having to, um, you know, just use a ton of water anyway um, for, you know, biochemical exposures or something like that. So, um, yeah, I've never run into specifically like just the sodium metal itself. Um, but typically, even if you would imagine I'm trying to think other cases, you know, because one of the things that people try is so especially um, if you consider like you had a, a caustic congestion. So say someone drank some um, hydrochloric acid or something like that, right? Um, or bleach, for instance, is, is, um, you know, something like that. Um, some providers will try to neutralize it or say, okay, well, if they drink a base, I'm going to give them an acid and that'll neutralize it out. Um, or if they had a, a, an acid, I'm going to give them a I mean, sodium bicarb and that'll neutralize it out. We don't like to do that because one, um, what happens when you neutralize an acid or a base? We well, produce uh, you produce gas and you produce heat, right? So um, not only do you have that caustic injury going on, but now you have all this extra gas being produced here, which can cause distension, which can cause damage to that tissue further, can lead to perforations. And that heat can also lead to thermal injuries. So the idea in those cases there is just dilute it out, right? So we go ahead and just make sure we're using a ton of dilution um, and, and try to prevent um, any further injury from happening in those cases there. Uh, so on the skin, that would be no different in those cases. So, uh, so you just out of curiosity, if a patient took a drug that can cause the opposite effects, such as meiosis and mydriasis, does the effect cancel each other out? That's a good question, and it depends. Um, so you'll find that depending on the situation, maybe they took more of one particular drug than another. So you may find that one is more predominant. So for instance, if someone took, um, say, a bunch of diphenhydramine and an opioid, right? So they took you know, maybe Percocet or something along with diphenhydramine. You know, diphenhydramine should cause mydriasis because it's an anticholinergic. Opioid should cause meiosis. And so um, you may find that the anticholinergic properties would maybe are more predominant and then you would see the mydriasis. I don't think you really get kind of a, a balancing out effect where they would be kind of normal range, uh, normal sized pupils. Um, but you may find that especially over time too, it may evolve. So they may come in very midriatic at first, but then they come in uh, more meiotic later on, right? So it uh, depends on the situation there. Um, an interesting case would be like the organophosphates where um, there was uh, exposures and it's kind of interesting. There was a, um, uh, back in Japan, I think this was in the 90s at some point, maybe late 80s, um, there was a uh, kind of this like death cult where basically they were trying to um, commit a terrorist attack and they actually released uh, sarin gas on a Japanese subway. And so sarin gas is an uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, it's an organo, um, not an organophosphate, but it's one of those nerve agents. And so what's interesting is you actually see the nicotinic effects present early and then the uh, cholinergic or the muscarinic effects then predominate later on. So these patients actually show up, and if you recall, that mnemonic we use for nicotinic effects was the days of the week. Well, that M was mydriasis. So these patients were showing up, and even though it was an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor they were seeing, um, they were presenting initially those nicotinic symptoms. They were midriatic at first, and then as the muscarinic effects took over, they became meiotic. So things evolve over time too. So it, it, again, it always comes down to, it depends, is my answer to most things. So. Um, see any other questions on that stuff? I see nothing in the chat, so I'm assuming I've answered all of your questions to sufficient abilities. Let me see. Um, let's see how many slides I've left here. I have a decent amount of slides. Um, I'm going to talk about snakes now, if you guys don't mind. So um, I'll talk about snakes first, and then um, we'll come back tomorrow and probably finish off with our marine envenomations and some other creepy crawlies and stuff like that. So if you don't like pictures of snakes or spiders and things like that, um, this might not be the best section for you. But guess what? We live in Florida, and you're going to see a lot of this stuff. So this is why we, we talk about it for sure. Um, OK, so let's get into envenomations. I like to talk about snakes. I do enjoy a good snake bite in terms of treatment. Pretty fun. Um, not great for the patient though. So that you know, I don't uh, you know suggest people go out and get bitten by snakes on purpose. But anyway, getting into um, common venomous Florida snakes. So we're gonna have two main varieties. We're gonna have um, what we call the Crotalidae or the pit vipers, and then we're gonna have the Elapidae or the coral snakes. So those are the kind of two big delineations. <clears throat> 
The reason why I make that delineation is mainly because um, they have very different toxins and so they uh, present very differently from one another. So to get into the uh, crotalidae first, we're gonna talk about those and then we'll get into the elapidae second. And so you can see the list here in terms of the common Florida snakes. We have the copperheads, we're gonna have cottonmouths. I'll show you some pictures in a moment. Um, also the pygmy rattlesnakes and then some Eastern diamondbacks. <clears throat> There's a few other ones uh, smattered around here and there. Um, and keep in mind, people in Florida, the laws to keep uh, exotic animals um i don't know if you've watched tiger king by any uh, chance um but owning exotic animals is uh surprisingly easy and so we have snake handlers that will be you know keeping private um private you know uh, uh pets that are you know black mambas and green mambas and all kinds of egyptian cobras and all kind of things like that and actually uh i would recommend once we are back open and uh, the country's open you can do this um there is a uh, serpentarium <clears throat> in st cloud um i would suggest checking out if you're into snakes because they have a lot of really cool stuff there um and i can give you more information later if you like i, I have no um uh financial ties with them although uh you know i would love to that guy's just fascinating very good chance to, to talk to him but He's been bitten by so many snakes, he's, had like, he's missing a few fingers from some of his envenomations. But anyway, um, getting into the epidemiology, we typically see because reptiles are cold-blooded animals, they are more active during the warmer months. So most of the bites happen between May and October. Although I've seen snake bites that happen in December in some cases there. So it just depends on, on how active the snakes are. And we typically see that the frequent victims are gonna be either handlers and collectors, um, obviously, because if you're around the snakes, you're more likely to get exposed to them and, and have a bite. Um, kids, because they may see something colorful on the ground, they may be running around outside, um, they are more likely to get it. And then, um, unfortunately, this is a disease of the Y chromosome, as it turns out. Why, you may ask? Well, um, I don't know if you are, are aware, but testosterone does make you do some, some pretty silly things. Um, and so... Interestingly enough, if you look again, this is more epidemiology for the U.S. here. Um, you know, if you see a snake on the ground, I don't know that you know uh, a lot of people would say, "Let me go pick that up." But if say if you have, for instance, alcohol involved, or you want to take like a selfie with the snake, you know, this is where we see some of these bites here. And a lot of this stuff sounds incredibly stupid, and it absolutely is. But again, this is what keeps me in business. So um, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell them to stop necessarily. Um, so anyways, we see that a lot. And actually, what's interesting is if you go into other, maybe like underdeveloped countries, you go into other places where um, you have a lot more like, um, you know, farming and things like that, where a lot of like cobras and whatnot are, are more present, um, you actually find that the split between males and females and adults is actually pretty equal because both of them are out there uh, potentially being exposed. But here in the U.S., it's usually males who are like handling the snakes and picking them up. So anyway, so first off here, we have our pygmy rattlesnake. And so some of the things I want you to, to kind of focus in on are going to be how we identify whether a snake is venomous or not here in Florida. So we'll talk about some of the common features here. So one of the things you can already notice is they have a rattle on the tail. That's not always there, especially after they shed recently, but that's something we look for. Um, they also are gonna have a big triangular head. And so this is for the crotality specifically. These are called pit vipers. So a big triangle head is also gonna be another clue that we're dealing with one of these. Here is a copper head. These are actually kind of the weaker of the bunch. You're gonna see these are kind of wimpy in terms of uh, envenomation as compared to some of the other ones. Pygmy rattlesnakes tend to be a little bit worse than, than these guys. You have the water moccasin or the cotton mouth. Obviously you can see why we call them a cotton mouth. You can notice the big white mouth here. Um, but again, you can't always go off the coloring of the snake. You can't just say, oh, it was a black snake. There's a lot of black snakes out there that are non-venomous, but we'll look at some other um, common uh, physical features there. And then we have the Eastern Diamondback. These guys can be really, really nasty in terms of envenomation and uh, can be quite difficult to treat. They pack a pretty hefty punch. These are quite large snakes, uh, as, well, as you see. So how do we identify these? Basically, they're called pit vipers because they have these heat-sensing pits, and this is how they actually kind of track their prey. They can actually detect minute changes in temperature and be able to get whatever animal they're going after, for instance. Um, they will also have large hinged fangs. It's basically like two hypodermic needles um, that they can use to inject their venom into their prey. And then we'll also talk about a few other things here. So one, you can see the, the fangs listed here. 
Notice here's a harmless, non-venomous snake. Notice here they may have some teeth, but they're not going to have the same sort of fangs as you would expect to see. Um, we can even use things like the anal plates to tell us whether or not the snake might be venomous. And again, this is just here in the U.S., specifically here in Florida. Um, so say, for instance, here with a rattlesnake, you'd have one. If you see the rattle, that's helpful, but maybe not because, um, you know, things like copperheads and cottonmouths won't have this. But if you have a single row of anal plates, then that means it could be venomous, right? Versus a double row here would mean not so much. And you may say, like, why would I ever need to look at the anal plates of a snake to know if it's venomous or not? And hopefully you're not close enough to the snake to look at the anal plates. But I'll tell you an example of this. And nowadays, we always just say, "We'll just take a picture of the snake," because I don't know too many people who don't have a um, who don't have a, a phone with a camera in their pocket, right? Um, but back in the day when this was not as available, we would have patients who would bring in the snakes with them, and sometimes it'd even be decapitated, um, and so they would just have the body of the snake and not necessarily the head. And without the head, it's really difficult to determine for the most part whether it's venomous or not, right? Because a lot of the coloring may not really be all that indicative, so it can be tough to tell. And so the smartest man I've ever met, Dr. Kunisaki, who was my, my medical director during my fellowship, um, one time they had a patient in the ER uh, who was, had been bit by the snake and they didn't know if it was venomous or not. And, um, but they, the, you know, the patient had brought in the body of the snake that the head was, was not available. And so couldn't tell, hey, do we need to give the antidote? Do we not? You know, what do we do here? And so Dr. Kunisaki comes strolling into the ER. He's got his coffee there and, and he looks at it. He takes a look at the body. He's like, non-venomous. And the, the attending at the ER, he's just like, how can you tell? He's like, you can tell by looking at the, the, the rows right behind the anal plate here. And the guy goes, Dr. Kunisaki, you're the only person I know that can look at a snake's ass and tell whether it's venomous or not. I always thought it was one of my favorite stories about him. But um, anyway, other than that, other things you can look at include the pupils. So you'll find that um, pit vipers have elliptical pupils here, whereas the non-venomous snakes typically will have round pupils. And then the presence of a rattle is helpful, but it may not always be present there. See, Kylie asks, I heard that non-venomous has bigger head and more teeth because they need to have a better bite to grab onto food. Um, not necessarily a bigger head, maybe, I mean, because if you look at the pit viper here, they have a large triangular shaped head, so it's bigger than, you know, their their neck for sure. Um, but certainly they have those those rows of teeth because, yeah, they have to grab on. That'll actually become important when I talk about the eastern coral snake here in just a few moments. Um but in terms of the bite characteristics, you're going to find, um, you know, especially if you didn't have any snake available, you had no picture, um, and you were looking at the actual bite itself, you know, obviously you'd expect to see two fang marks, but that may not always be the case. Sometimes the fang has broken off, it hasn't regrown, so you may only see one mark there, and it could still be a venomous uh, bite. Um, frequently, though, you're going to find snakes may uh, have like dry bites. And so about 20 to 25% of the time, uh, the snake doesn't actually inject any venom because one, it's typically not looking at you like you're its next meal. So it probably doesn't want to waste all that venom. And where if it's eaten recently, then it may not want to do that as well. Are you saying rose teeth? No, I'm saying rows of teeth. It's like a row of teeth. I don't think they have any actual rose teeth unless they're in the garden recently or something like that. But um Sorry if my enunciation is, is poor today. Um, also, you know, think about things like the size of the snake. So the bigger snakes mean bigger bite, more more venom potentially. And then also look at the location of the bite. So this can be important um, because, um, you know, obviously we're going to be looking at the, the injury itself to, to actually do our measurements and things like that. And I'll talk about the, the characteristics of the envenomation in a moment. But um, essentially, you know, you'd expect to see frequently that um, the feet, might be one spot where you see a lot of bites, especially if you're just walking around and you didn't see the snake. That's one way you see a lot of envenomations. Um, otherwise, it's frequently the hands because people are trying to handle the snakes. So kids, you see that in a lot. A lot of male patients, you'll see that in terms of, of bites on the hands. Um, but sometimes you get some atypical places for bites. So for instance, if you have someone who's trying to um, take a selfie with the snake, I've seen bites on the lip. I've seen bites on the cheek and neck. Not great, right? So again, eh, probably just leave them alone. No need to handle them. So looking at the actual envenomations uh, themselves, you can kind of notice some things here. So one, you're going to see a lot of swelling associated with this. You're going to see progressive swelling that can progress. You know, if it's a bite on the hand, it can progress all the way up the arm, and they can be double in size of the unaffected limb. So they can be quite significant in terms of their um, uh, how much it gets expanded. You see these bullae, they can form here. You can have a lot of ecchymosis. Um, you're going to find that the venom itself tends to be, um, uh, works as a, basically causes a coagulopathy. That's what you can see, why you see so much bleeding, why you see so much uh, ecchymosis associated with this. But a lot of swelling, a lot of um, ecchymosis associated with these bites here. And there's a lot of pain as well. It's quite painful bites. 
And so what you end up seeing is there's a lot of different antigens that are here. There's proteolytic enzymes, there's pro and anticoagulants, there's even cardiotoxins in some of them. Um, and so directly causing tissue damage is one of the big things we see there. That's why you see so much um, uh, pain. That's why you end up seeing so much um, swelling and that progressive swelling is one thing we're really worried about. But it's also the, the systemic effects we care about as well, things like the coagulopathy. And so that'll go into the monitoring parameters we'll get in just a few moments here. So what do we do? Or actually the local reactions we're gonna see here, so a lot of painful swelling, a lot of paresthesias that can develop potentially. You'll see all this ecchymosis and blistering, and here's a good example of, of that. Um, in some cases, you may even see rhabdomyolysis, although that's quite rare. There's a snake called the cane break rattlesnake, which we don't see too frequently especially down here this far south in Florida, um, but that can be something you see occasionally. And in general, if you're considering like how toxic each of these uh, bites are, rattlesnakes tend to be the worst, followed by the water moccasins and then the copperheads. In some places, people don't even treat copperhead bites for the most part. They just you know, kind of work with a, you know just supportive care. In terms of systemic reactions though, one, patients may have a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear because they were just bitten by a venomous snake um, and there are a lot of pains associated with this as well. Um, in addition to that, you can see, you know, tachycardia, nausea, vomiting, just because they're so anxious and maybe kind of freaked out. Um, renal failure, occasionally if you're dealing with something like um, rhabdomyolysis is a potential. Um, we don't have these here in Florida, but they actually even have like neurotoxins and some of like the Mojave rattlesnake you might even find out west. So depending on where you're working at, you may find different uh, kind of flavor of snakes that are, that are there. And then the hematologic toxicity is what we really care about as well, because um, we can find patients that will develop um, significant coagulopathy, whether it's increases in PTINR, you can see fibrinogen decrease, platelets decrease. It can be pretty significant. And so um, for the most part, one of the big questions we get at the poison center is like, well, do I need to treat this patient or not? And so typically in order to evaluate for a dry bite, we'll wait about eight to 12 hours after they show up in the ER to determine what we need to do. And things we're looking at are to see, um, do they have progressive swelling, which I usually consider if it passes a joint, then I consider that progressive, like a major joint. So if there is a bite in the hand and it crosses the wrist, then I consider that progressive. If it is on the forearm, it crosses into the elbow, I consider that progressive. Um, and then we're looking for the coagulopathy as well. Things we tell patients not to do, this is really important kind of first aid uh, stuff, is like don't turn it, don't put a tourniquet on. People think, oh, I'm gonna stop the spread of the venom. What you're really doing is stopping oxygen supply to the, those tissues that are now dying off, and so we don't wanna do that. Not only that, but patients put on tourniquets way too tight, and they end up causing a lot of that to be released at one time, um, and, and basically can lead to some cardiovascular complications, which can be a problem. Sorry about the, the screaming baby in the background, but, other things to consider is you don't want to cut or suck on, on the wound itself. You actually find that it's not really all that effective. Um, the best thing you can do is, and I tell patients this, is uh, the best first aid item you can have in the case of a snake bite is a set of car keys because that can get you to the ER that much faster. Um, I had one time I told that to students and they were like, oh, what do you do with the car keys? Do you rub it on, on the wound? And I, I said, no, you, you put them in your car so you can drive. But other things to assess, you know, um, tetanus status, do we need to get that updated? You know, look for allergies in case they've maybe had bites before, or maybe reactions to um, antivenom previously, and then find out have they had bites um, in, in the past and what do they do about them? Um, mainly because uh, usually a thing that pre disposes a patient to get a snake bite is if they had a previous snake bite, because usually they had bad behavior that led to that, and so you can see your repeat customers. And then we can also help to manage their, their pain and anxiety. So in terms of uh, monitoring, we're gonna go ahead and do circumferential measurements. So you usually use two lines to mark around, uh, say for instance, you're marking around um, the arm or wherever the bite was, and you can measure um, where the, the swelling is going in terms of it getting thicker or if it's actually progressing up the arm itself. I'm sorry if you couldn't see that. Um, in terms of hematologic monitoring, we're doing platelets, PTINR, PTT, and fibrinogen. We typically monitor this initially and then every six hours to see how that's progressing. Um, for the most part, and you'll see these patients will be so swollen, you're going to think, oh man, they're going to have compartment syndrome. And they, they really aren't. What they really need is, is um, the antivenom. And so um, some places they consider doing things like fasciotomy and digitotomies, but we typically don't recommend those unless um, absolutely recommended or you know absolutely necessary. Um, in a lot of cases, it mainly can be kind of disfiguring. Um, and rarely do we really need blood products. Here's an example of this, um, uh, you know, this would look like if they actually did a uh, fasciotomy. And again, this is gonna be pretty scarring for the patient. So um, the best thing we can do is just give them more antivenom. 
So what do we do? So we uh, the main one we use now, and there's actually a second product, but I'm mainly going to talk about this one here, is going to be Crofab, which is our anti-venom. And basically this is a sheep-derived product here that is um, antibodies against these four snakes. And you'll notice that even though it doesn't cover all the snakes that are here in Florida, um, they do have a lot of cross-reactivity, and so you'll find they can work for um, for the ones that we have here. So, And what we're going to give them for is if they're having progressive swelling, if they're having coagulopathy, um, or if they're having any kind of hemodynamic compromise, that's when we're going to go ahead and give it for those patients there and so um, we can look here at the dosing but basically based on the 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 uh, how you know symptomatic the patients are we give between four and six vials and we look to see if they have any kind of reactions to it any kind of uh, you know allergy and then we go ahead and, and administer the full amount over about an hour or so and then we actually give them some maintenance doses afterwards to make sure they don't have any kind of recurrence of symptoms like swelling or coagulopathy. And keep in mind, it doesn't reverse the swelling, but it just prevents it from getting worse. Um, and so you may find it may take weeks before patients will have full um, you know, resolution of that swelling there. So it's an important thing to, to note as well. And then we'll monitor them about 24 hours past the last maintenance dose and see how they respond. Make sure they don't have any delayed coagulopathies. Uh, and if they don't, then they're usually good to go. And we can send them on their way home. Um, so here's an example of what this looks like. This is actually the newest one called Anavip. Um, and so uh, looking at Crofab, um, I've talked about antibodies before, and we know that the full antibody here, the whole IgG, this can be um, problematic from a lot of standpoints, mainly due to allergy, right? So if this was the original antivenoms we had were actually um, equine sourced, and so these would actually cause pretty significant anaphylaxis. And we'll look at some equine antibodies uh, a little bit later on. But um, when we use... Um, Crofab, this is actually just the fab version of the, the, the molecule. Basically, we cut off the FAB portion of the antibody, and this is what we use for Crofab. The problem with this is that it gets cleared from the body pretty quickly, and so this is why you end up seeing like delayed uh, coagulopathies and whatnot. The newest one we have is called the FAB2 fragment, and so you can see here that it's a bigger molecule. It lasts longer, and some people feel it's better for preventing recurrent coagulopathies. But, so if you ever see Anavip, that's the new product, and Crofab is kind of the old one that we, we still use pretty commonly. So, um, again, as I mentioned, the swelling is not going to be reversed specifically with using um, uh, Crofab, but in, in case patients sometimes will have anaphylaxis, oftentimes you just have to treat through it. So give them steroids, give them Benadryl, maybe Epi if need be. Um, we typically will tell patients to make sure they don't participate in any kind of like contact sports or anything like that for you know, a couple of weeks after the bite because they could see um, you know, bleeding and bruising or propensity for that uh, is one thing to note. And then the same thing goes for like elective procedures and whatnot. Maybe um, they may be more prone to bleeding in those cases there. In terms of the serum sickness, this is something that is sort of a delayed reaction. Your body has to these foreign antibodies. It kind of presents like flu-like symptoms. Normally we just treat with some, some Tylenol and that's usually good enough for, for most cases there. So anyway, um, I think I'm going to cut it off there. I think I've talked long enough and my children obviously uh, do not want me to, to go any further as you can tell by their screaming. So um, do you have any questions that I can answer um, right now before I go and cut this off? And then we'll finish up tomorrow and then our review will be on Thursday. All right, well, I don't see any questions popping up here. I'm assuming the delay is not too bad. Oh, how, how does iron cause hypotension? Um, so that one's an interesting one. Um, essentially, what you're going to find is that with iron, it kind of goes through a couple of different stages. Um, but one thing that it can do in high doses is that it can actually uncouple oxidative phosphorylation. So the normal process that your mitochondria use to form ATP. Um, it basically can stop that from occurring. So your body kind of switches from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism. And so when that happens, even though the patient's being adequately oxygenated, the, the cells just can't use it. And so that ends up causing a very significant lactic acidosis that can develop there. And as your body becomes more acidotic, those proteins tend to denature and they can't really respond as well to um, you know, things like norepi or epinephrine. And so that can lead them to have a difficult time responding to your pressors and whatnot. And so generally it's how you see the hypotension develop there. Um, they kind of get this leaky sort of um, uh, almost like a septic kind of thing there where you see this you know, a lot of inflammation happening they can kind of leak fluids into the intravascular space and so that's another thing as well is you got to make sure they're staying well hydrated give them lots of fluids and pressors to help re respond to that so uh, i'm not going to get too much into iron um any further i could i mean i can do a whole class just on tox stuff but uh, uh that's how you would end up seeing that so you don't see anything on the sticky board. Uh, I don't have any other questions here. So if uh, anything comes up, though, we can definitely talk about it tomorrow. Uh, and I will see you all then. Thanks so much for, uh, for joining me again.